Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, and uh, welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. It's a, a great pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, our featured speaker. Uh, Sergio Fajardo is a very prominent, widely respected uh, political figure in Colombia, a good friend, and I'm proud to say uh, a member of the Inter-American Dialogue since 2008. He participated in a uh, special commission dialogue recently had on education reform that was co-chaired by Presidents uh, Zedillo of Mexico and uh, Lagos of Chile, directed by Ariel Fishbein, who's here uh, as well with us this afternoon. Sergio served as governor of Antioquia from 2012 to 2016, and before that, the mayor of Medellin from 2004 to 2007. And he was widely credited for that city's impressive transformation. I had the opportunity to visit Sergio several times uh, when he was mayor. He showed me around, and I saw many of the significant improvements and innovations that resulted in such a dramatic decline in homicides in a city that just years before was known as the murder capital of the world. Uh, to put it in some perspective, today we talk about high homicide rates in the Northern Triangle countries of Central America and Venezuela, numbers of about 60, maybe 70, 100 for 100,000. In Medellin, the number was 381 for 100,000. And in 2007, the last year of uh, when Sergio was, was mayor, it was down to 29, 100,000. So that's a, 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 a stunning uh, turnaround by any measure. Sergio gave a lot of importance uh, to aesthetics, constructed the most beautiful buildings, and the, put the best libraries in the poorest areas of the city. Sergio is a mathematician by training, he, getting undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Los Andes, and also he has a doctorate from the University of Wisconsin. Worked as a while, worked for some time as an academic and a professor, and also as a columnist for a few years before entering politics. In 2010, he was a vice presidential candidate uh, of the Green Party with Antanas Mokas, perhaps the only ticket in history with two mathematicians. <laughs> He's the author of two books, one, Medellin del Miedo a la Esperanza, but he also wrote another book called The Model Theory of Stochastic Processes, Lecture Notes in Logic. Um, logic, which is something that's in, we need a lot today. Um, I'm not sure, I, I looked it up on Amazon, and I see there are a few copies available, but they cost $1,550.14. So, and that's in paperback. Um, so you're welcome. There are a few copies left, so you might want to rush and get one after this, after this session. Uh, not exactly a political manifesto, but I'm sure it's a wonderful read, so I urge you to look at it. Uh, this morning, Sergio gave a terrific talk at the uh, Organization of American States uh, that I had an opportunity to attend uh, called The New Paradigm for Public Management. For this session, uh, this afternoon, he has gener graciously agreed to share his thoughts about Colombia, a country that finds itself at a critical moment, having just achieved an historic peace accord with the FARC, but one that has been contentious in a very polarized society. Like in much of, like in, uh, in much of the rest of the world, certainly including this country, the United States, there is widespread disenchantment with traditional politicians and political parties. The country is facing a formidable policy agenda including inequality, insecurity, and corruption, three topics that Sergio has been working on for many decades and has been talking about recently as he travels throughout his country and talks with different communities. As Colombia faces legislative and presidential elections the first part of next year, the new ideas for tackling the country's challenges are absolutely essential. Um, Sergio will make a few opening remarks, and then I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll invite your uh, comments, and we look forward to a very good exchange. So thank you all very, very much for coming, and it's a great delight and privilege to welcome 
Governor Mayor Dialogue Member Sergio Fajardo. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you. And I never thought I would be talking about these subjects here. But thanks to your invitation, I'm going to tell you where is Colombia heading. That's one way of talking about this thing. And I'm going to talk very quickly and short to give us, give you an idea of how we see the country, how I see the country right now. And I'm going to present some very basic ideas. This is not a program for the presidency or so, just a way of understanding Colombia and the way we stand in, a, in trying to understand and make and direct Colombia. I like to use a figure, here's the, the figure, that I always write my presentations my, with my handwriting. This particular one is my daughter's handwriting because she didn't like the, the picture that I made of a book, of a books, uh, notebook that has a page that is completely filled. And the title for that page is Violence and Destruction in Colombia. We have had plenty of violence in our country. There is not a single word to be written in that page of our history. And our claim is that we have to move on, turn that page, and then continue to write a new page. So that's the idea that I use throughout Colombia in explaining this. It is easy to explain to any audience, any level, but it's simple. We have a page which is completely filled. We have to pay, move on and turn that page and have the next page when you move from the page that is filled, an empty blank page that we want to write down with a different hand and we are not going to have the ones who wrote the previous pages to write the new one in Colombia. So that's the idea. And how? Three basic things. Reconciliation, turn the corruption page, and then education, the engine of social transformation. Roughly speaking, reconciliation is a way of turning the violence page and then making sure that it doesn't come back. No se nos devuelve. Then there is another page that goes along with the corruption page, the violence page, which is the corruption page. It's right there. Think of the case that when we are moving, we are reading or writing, and sometimes those, we have two pages that are, you don't see the, the next one, but it's tied to it, and you have to put it apart, and then you have to move on with that one or two, which is the corruption page. And then the new one, we are going to write the new one, and that's the heading with education. And I'm going to explain very briefly what I have in mind, and then we can go on and talk to you. How are we going to go about the reconciliation in Colombia? The first point, and I've been saying this, and every day I think it's more and more important. The first point that we have in Colombia to have a real reconciliation is make sure that we respect the peace accord with rigor and transparency. You have heard, or, may, or maybe you haven't heard, but uh, recently there have been some political figures that have been saying that the, the agreement has to be completely destroyed. I think that if they do that in Colombia, we will write another page of violence in Colombia and it will be terrible for our country. I have no doubt about that. I'm just saying it for what I understand, what I know about our country, and what it would mean. And I claim that we have to move on past that page and then have the opportunity to write another one. Reconciliation begins with this process, respect and transparency. We're going through a difficult time in Colombia with, regard, with respect to the process. We may talk about that during the conversation. The second point about in the reconciliation that we talk about is citizens' culture. What do I mean by that? We have been living for decades where the main characters in the Colombian narrative have been guerrillas, 
narco traffickers, paramilitary, illegals, corrupt. Those have been always on the headlines in Colombia for decades. For all the Colombians that are here, we have been living with them as the main actors, main characters in the Colombian narrative. And a society where you live under those conditions for decades, you have to look very deep into the culture of the country and understand what type of culture we have in Colombia. We have a culture where we have very difficult interpersonal relations, community relations. We have to learn in Colombia something that sounds very trivial so that we can be different without being enemies. In Colombia, you are different, you are an enemy. Immediately, there is verbal aggression, and right there is physical violence. That's our history. And we have to make sure that if we move along, then we review and, and work deeply on the way we relate to each other. We have to talk about being able to have coexistence in Colombia, uh, pedagogy of living differently, and it's an urgency for our society and for those of us who have lived there and we have seen anything different from what I'm just saying. And at the same time, we have had illegality throughout these decades. And then we have to work on that. We have to work on a society where we have a culture of illegality, understanding the respect of basic norms in the relations that we have among ourselves. Sounds very elementary, but it's quite a, I think it's a huge project for our country. And this is the time when we move on. If we manage to turn this page and then give us, or we should give ourselves the opportunity to have a different culture. And we have to work on it as a Colombian project, as a society project in our country. Of course, it has multi, uh, several dimensions, but that's crucial for our country. And the third condition for reconciliation is associated with security. If we pass this page, turn this page of violence with FARC and hopefully with ELN, that means that this chapter of Colombian history associated with violence and politics and ideologies is over. It should have been over a long time ago, but we are in Colombia. It took us a little longer. After the collapse of the Berlin Wall, it took us a little. But moving on, then we have to understand security in a different perspective. It's not a confrontation. It's a right that people have in order to have a normal, decent life. Because if we don't pay attention to that with the difficulties that we have, are going to appear other violence in Colombia. And if we are working so hard to have this chapter of our violence finish, we have to watch out not to brew another set of violence that, given our history, then a few years later will become another chapter of violence in Colombia. So we have to go through reconciliation. Those are the three main points, understanding reconciliation. Then comes something that is, right now, live in Colombia. Let me say a few words before I say a few words about corruption. I've been going around Colombia, not in Bogota, not in Medellin. I've been around the countryside, la regiones, las provincias. I am from the province, from one particular one. Now, and talking to people, listening carefully and explaining these very basic things to people. And if you go to Colombia today, you find something that I have never seen before. And after all these years, I have had the chance to be through many places, walking throughout Colombia in many instances. But you see a country which is deeply divided, polarized, associated with the peace agreement, with the no. Remember that the plebiscite was won by the no, but won by a very small margin, but the no won with a 65% abstention. And then the confrontation Uribe Santos is very deep in many parts of the country. Those, that subject is very much in the skin of Colombia's people. And it's not an, uh, a friendly discussion. It's very aggressive, very aggressive, and it's increasing in its aggressivity. And that's very dangerous in Colombia. And at the same time, 
there was one drop that was missing in order to fill the corruption uh, base. Its name is Odebrecht. That drop came into Colombia. The base with the corruption substance overspilled, and then the country is indignant. Colombia is very upset about corruption throughout the country. So that produces a very particular mix. Indignation and polarization is something new for us in Colombia. And it's different from the Colombia that we used to have because in Colombia, we, throughout our lives, we have said many times we are about to go for el abismo. And we have never gone through the abismo. We have been there, we looked, and then we moved back. But very simply, not very rigorous, but I think it's correct, we always had a, an, uh, a threat from the outside the, the establishment. The guerrillas from, were from the outside. Narcotraffic was from the outside. But right now, the problem is inside, inside the establishment. And it's a deep problem with a particular, as I said, a particular mix that we didn't know in Colombia. And it's in a difficult moment that we go throughout what is happening in Colombia. And you can feel it, hear it, sense it throughout the, the different regions outside Bogota. Then there is this page of corruption. We have been talking about corruption and fighting corruption and clientelism. That for me is the main cause in the Colombian corruption. For 17 years, we are about to become 18 years old. When I say we, the movement that I have led, that we began in Medellin, and that's the one that has me here. And but we were missing that drop, and things happen. It's very extraordinary to see how a society quickly changes. And that Colombia is hopeless in many senses. There is nobody trust anyone. The institutions in Colombia it are at a very low point, and there is a, a malestar. ¿Qué se dice malestar? discomfort, malaise around. Some people have rage, and then we have that Colombia. And this chapter of corruption has been very important because people have seen it traditionally from the central powers in Bogota, in our capital. They used to say the things are happening, but those things happen not in Bogota with the central powers, but on the countryside, away from Bogota. And what Odebrecht showed was that in Bogota, of course, there was corruption, but it was more expensive. So in the regions, and there is a discomfort, a growing discomfort in the regions of Colombia, because there is a sense that they want to centralize more powers in the central power in Colombia. And that you can add up that, that up to the sense of discomfort throughout the country. I'll just say a few words because I can speak about this subject for a day. And I'm not going to do that, don't worry. But I wrote down the Colombian fallacy. You are going to see in Colombia the most corrupt people being right in front of the fight against corruption. It's not a joke. It's typical Colombian. The most corrupt people, and they are going to come out, and they are going to come out, and they are going to exhibit a new laws that we have to have. And they would be talking very loud, very firm, saying what has to, do, to be done with corrupt people and the new laws that we need. In Colombia, for I wrote it down, every problem is solved by a new set of laws. The ones who never abide by the laws that we had, then they are going to come up with a new set of laws saying these are the solution. And that's the fallacy that we have. We come up with a new law that is going to solve a problem, and we have an ethical problem in our so Colombian society. So we never think about what has happened in there, but the law will solve the problem. We are called Santanderistas. That's an expression that is called in Colombia, Santander, you know, was the law's man in the confrontation with Bolivar. But anyway, anything in Colombia has a law that solves the problem, but the problem is there. It's an ethical problem, and that's the way how things work in our country. 
My claim is the way you get into power will determine how you govern. And those who pay in order to get in there, when they get into power, they go, come in there to re regain what they invested in the campaign in order to uh, pay for what they had with the revenues associated with that. That's the corruption. And it's very simple. How you pay the debts, very, or how they pay and make the money, positions, contracts. And they need that the law doesn't apply impunity. That's all. It's very simple. In Colombia, we wouldn't be talking about corruption if it, if it is not because of the bread. Thanks to Brazil, thanks to the United States that gave a very minimal information, we know about corruption. Otherwise, in Colombia, they would come over here and we said, there is no corruption in Colombia. And we know that that's false, and we know that that's minimal with the things that we have. And that's my country, our country for all, some of us. And one statement that is the worst of all, make sure that, well, you can steal, but do the work. Eh, que roben, pero que hagan obras, which is the worst possible thing, because it's a resignation, say, OK, we understand that part of the public budget, it's yours. What, what we want to do with you is negotiate to see what you are going to give us. And that's the way it works, and that's their power. I read it in a very simple way. Let's see if I, if I can translate that in, into English. I'll say it in Spanish first. Los actos acusan, las obras excusan. It's shorter. It's, it's more difficult to explain to a general audience, but you can understand. The, so let me see if I practice my English. The acts accuse, acts accuse, works excuse. Well, thank you. And then the challenge, and I've been in all these discussions, go to a radio interview and say, well, but how are you going to fight corruption? Tell me. I said, I've been mayor. I've been governor. We have been in campaigns. We haven't paid a single peso for a single vote. And we have won. And I have been dealing as mayor, as a governor of Medellin and Antioquia. We have managed billions of pesos. And we have done what has to be done in order to fight corruption, that the key antidote is transparency. That transparency is the best thing to do against corruption. The thing is that transparency is a political decision, it's an uh, administrative action, it's an ethical conviction. So the way you deal with things. And the best way to fight corruption is to make sure that the corrupts don't get elected. That's the best way to fight corruption. It's very difficult to see who, who, who are corrupt under the Colombian tradition said he hasn't been condemned. So if you have to be condemned in a judicial system that doesn't work in order to be cal equal, uh, recognized as corrupt, so there are, no corruption, there are no corrupt guys in Colombia. That's for sure. But everyone knows who that's part of our history, the history and our story of knowing everyone knows who is. But you have to make sure that they don't get into power. And the dilemma that we face is the following. There is such an indignation with politicians, with Congress. There are some polls now that suggest that FARC respect more favorability than the Congress, FARC, today. So you can imagine how low th these things are going to. But the thing is, within the way people are so upset about what is happening, the natural reaction is people go away from politics, so they don't participate in politics. And if they do that, that's the best alternative for corrupt people, because with the things that they have, their votes, they can buy much more, and they is easily win. And that's the challenge that we have. And to finish, just to, to say it very shortly, and then we have to come to the new page. So we have to turn the violence and destruction pay, the corruption page, then make sure that doesn't come back, reconciliation, and then we have the new page. In the new page, we have to change the narrative. We have quickly in Colombia to change the main characters of the history, the recent history in Colombia. Narcotraffic, guerrillas, narcotraffickers, paramilitary, corrupt people, illegals, and we have to move to a society where we can talk about teachers, scientists, innovators, entrepreneurship, culture, diversity, the richness that we have in our country. And that's a political decision. We have to move quickly.
to show that there is something in addition to what we have been doing. And it's, it's very powerful. I use the word education that allows me to put all these things together. Of course, with these words that I'm saying there, we claim that in a very unequal society, as we have in Colombia, then the main first step in order to tackle inequality, the, w the path that we choose is education. How we are going in a society where more, for more than 50 years we have been living in the conditions that we have living of destruction, illegality, and all these things, we have to show and say education is a path that gives hope, that allows us to think about dignity, respect, recognition, and capacities. We have plenty of capacities in our country, but we have never used them in a systematic way. A way to, shoot, to fight against inequality, we are, Colombia right now is in a very, let's see, I, I don't know if this is very, a very harsh word, which would be northless, but Colombia, if you ask in Colombia, where are we heading? What is our, what's the model of development that we have in Colombia? I'm sure that nobody can answer. In Colombia, we do many things. There are business, many things happen in Colombia, but are we moving in a direction that we could recognize and say, as a society, we're moving in a direction? We don't have it. For example, President Santos, the first point in his first initial term, as president says, he was claiming that it was the mining uh, wagon, la locomotora minera. And in his period, he has had more than eight ministers associated with mining and energy and the prices change, and we don't know, we are claiming that now the exports should be improving, and then we start talking about industrial policy because the exchange rate change, and we don't have the basis in order to have a solid model of society where we say we are going to bet on this. I think this is the moment. It's an opportunity to start betting and all these things, and I finish with an example, which is usually people tell me, don't use that word tax. Of course, we know that that's not a very, I mean, people don't like that word. But we claim something along the following lines, just to finish. In Colombia, since the year 2000, we have been paying a special tax, which is called war tax, or el impuesto al pat el patrimonio. El, el impuesto para la guerra, or the technical name is impuesto al patrimonio, paid by a few companies and a few individuals in Colombia. And the reason for that tax, uh, tax was that it was needed in order to fight the armed threat that we had in Colombia. So if we pass that page, we turn, turn that page, the new one, how are we going to write it? This particular one that we are proposing. Where's the money? Colombia grows at, at a very low rate. It's not that bad. We always look around, and if we look around, say, well, well uh, Peru is doing a little better, but we are okay. Look at this, what is happening in Brazil, and that's always a way of doing the Colombian way. Say, look at here and here, we are okay, after all. Now, how are we going to pay for a new page in the Colombian history? We have to have a special education task in Colombia in order to write a new page associated with betting on these issues that we have in here. And we have to change quickly the narrative. These are the ideas that I wanted to present to you, very basic, associated with that page in the notebook that we are going to turn, the one that we are going to write, and what is Colombia and what Colombia is facing. So if you want, I can talk and come have a conversation with you. But that was that's the setting. Is this is not a again I want to emphasize this is not our government program. It's just a platform that tells you how we understand what we are going to build in Colombia. And that's the perspective that we have in order to change pages in Colombia. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. That was terrific. I see a lot of people in this audience who are anxious to ask questions or maybe their piece. And, uh, but I'll, I'm going to start maybe okay. with you. You can ask me the ones that you were <laughs> asking previously. Uh, I thought 
first of all, first I want to recognize Bernie Aronson, who is here, who is a member of the Inter-American Dialogue, a proud member, and also was the nice to meet you. Special envoy. Very well known. Somebody made a comment that uh, the concern is that this is going to, could turn out to be uh, the second Pueblo telegram to the Jewish question. In other words, that the first one was rejected, there is now a margin, as you say, in October, but that basically, given the political dynamics and the rhetoric and the political sort of forces in Colombia, that they're going to end up in a presidential election. That's going to be that's going to be the impact. People are going to vote for it or against it for the second time. Do you share that? Is that no, no, no. That's no, and I hope not, because we lose again. And I'm going to explain why. Because with this peace process, I support the peace process. I wrote it down as the first condition for the reconciliation has to be: we have to abide by what the process. I mean, the agreement set and so on. But we have lacked something crucial, which is a pedagogy about what this means for Colombian society. That wasn't done, and it's not being done. And that's very costful, because Colombian society, I, don't, I think we have not grasped what it means to turn this page. Roughly speaking, because for most Colombians, when this was going to be signed, we were already at peace. And, Colo and we needed a leadership to explain what it meant. For example, what I'm saying here, when you turn this page, you are going to have the opportunity to change and to write a new page in a different way. But that wasn't done, and it is being done, and it would be very, I don't think it will be good for Colombia. But, of course, it's going to be an important issue. That's more than obvious. But our claim has been, my personal claim has been, for example, when people say, why don't we get together all the ones that voted yes for the plebiscite, let's unite in order to face the ones from the no side. And I have said, we don't participate in that. We want to have the peace agreement. We want to have it implemented. But we have to make sure our political project is not the peace agreement. The political project is that they come into politics. They can do politics. They defend their ideas doing politics. But we want to be in politics to write a new page, not to start to spend the rest of our lives talking about this page that is completely filled. And if we, if we divide ourselves between yes and no, that would be a disaster for Colombia, I think. You talked a lot about the corruption issue, and you said the key to, the, to addressing it is greater transparency. But um, while that's true, you also need an effective uh, judicial justice system. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, you know, Colombia had been had a constitutional court that was the kind of the, the model of the region. They've been talking about judicial reform since, you know, and I started to go to Colombia in the 1970s. They were talking about it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can have transparency, but if you don't have the capacity and professionalization and independence of the judiciary, it's going to be very hard to really tackle that effectively. What, what's been, in your view, kind of the problem there? Okay. I said it there, how people get into power in Colombia through clientelist basic paying in order to get into power. And if you pay in order to get into power, once you are in power, you are going, un voto comprado es un robo asegurado. That's for sure. And I'm talking about my personal experience being a candidate, facing people who buy votes, which is the traditional thing. In Colombia, it, it became a joke when the people say, well, the, the, the Caribbean, where are the Caribbean votes? And then there is these guys who, they have plenty of votes for the elections from very tiny places, and they bring huge amounts of votes, and then people win the election, 
and here in the center, when they win the election, then they have to pay back what for the votes that these other guys bought, and then that's the corruption thing. It's, this is a theater that we have been seeing in there. We have to take our masks, not our masks, masks off, because that's the essence of corruption, the way they get into power. And it has been a joke. It's not a joke. We're seeing what is happening, and I claim that we have to do the way we get into politics will determine how we get in there. Of course, we need the laws. I mean, of course, I'm not saying that we don't need laws, but at this moment, I always say these things because we have to emphasize the ethical condition of the political ways in Colombia. Do we need, of course, a system where we don't have impunity, which is huge in Colombia? It's huge. Now, the, pre the actual government, the Santos government tried twice to have a justice reform in Congress. And they, who have managed to get all the reformers that want, they wanted, given congressmen plenty of, how is the name here? The Mermelada is the name in Colombia, but now? Pork. 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 There is plenty of pork in Colombia. Plenty of pork, but it's incredible. Yeah? But for the justice reform, it, it was never enough. They are never going to change it. That's, what, that's dangerous, because people say, well, we have to have a new uh, Asamblea Constituyente. And that means, once again, let's rewrite our constitution. And that's very dangerous in Colombia. So we have to go step by step. I am a mathematician. Say, well, we, I have this huge problem. We are going to take one slide off. We have to do that. But usually people start talking about all the things that we have to do in Colombia, and then we do none. That's the traditional thing. Now, the next president in Colombia is going to have the most difficult conditions that we could ever dream. For example, something that in Colombia we haven't realized. We have had presidents who have had eight years in power each. That's 16 years with basically the same people. Because if you look at the government, the, the people who work with Santos and Uribe were the same. The thing, and Santos won the election because was Uribe's candidate. I don't know if you remember, I'm going to say in Spanish, the, well, in, in English it should sound funny, it's funny anyway. The guy who carried the three X, little X, los tres huevitos de Uribe, era Santos. That was the, the metaphor that Uribe, who is excellent at creating metaphors and explaining things, Uribe gave Santos his th three little eggs, los tres huevitos. And that's why he's president of Colombia. So they have been most much basically the same people and some good people. So you talk about Alejandro Gaviria, who is a very good friend of mine. He worked with Uribe and he worked with Santos. Gina Parodi, worked with Uribe, worked with Santos. Juan Carlos Pinzon, worked with Uribe, worked with, and so on. So they have been the same, 16 years in power. 16 years in power, and uh, it, the time is over, I think. Should be. <laughs> Let me, well, we'll help so. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Let me ask, I have two more questions, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody. But uh, one is that an issue which you didn't talk about much in your presentation, but you have talked about it in the past, which is the issue of drugs. Um, and the debate about what to do about drugs. And of course, it's, it's an issue here in, in this country now uh, because of the opioid heroin problem. And it's also an issue on the agenda between the United States and Colombia, and especially in light of the surge in coca cultivation. And, um, you know, it's, it won't go away. When, when the f foreign minister uh, of Santos, Mar Maria Angel Roguin, came did an event with her um, the beginning of the Santos government in 2010, first term, and she talked about the agenda and drugs was not mentioned. She didn't mention drugs because they're, the, understandably, Colombia wanted to go beyond the, the drug relationship that has so dominated in, in previous years. Now it's back. The issue is back in Colombia. It's, it's here, and it's on the bilateral agenda. 
what what I mean, are you and the government has come out with a strategy that President Santos talked to President Trump about? Are you what is how do you address it? Is there a way to do it? You had talked, I think, in the past about legalization idea, other ideas, but where do you see that today? I have talked and believed in legalization, but I know that it's not going to take. I mean, I'm not going to be alive, but at the time when the time comes, even though there have been some improvements, which I think are important and and would move move on. Now. But we have to be realistic and be, let me say this. Besides the United States, we have a Colombian problem associated with citizen security, urban security, which is, has a component associated with micro traffic. The market in Colombia, we are close to 50 million people. So we have these gangs who are associated with extortion, micro traffic and stealing in the cities. And there is plenty of relation with the drug traffic. So we have a problem in Colombia associated with our security that we have to be dealing with. Now, what I would always want is, of course, talk about substitution. But unfortunately, we are not moving, this is my impression, we are not moving well on that direction. President Santos said that Colombia was going to eradicate uh, around 100,000 hectares. And I don't see what is going to happen if they do that, which I, I hope it is true. Let's say, let's be positive, because I am Colombian, and I want Colombia to do well, and I want that to happen. Let's say that that happens. But if there is no substitution, and we have been seeing the fragility of the peace process in the way that the state has to get into the places where they used to be. And this hasn't been done well so far. So we are with something fragile, which is as we move along and we don't see things happening, then it opens up for the opposition to attack the process and to create a, an, uh, an atmosphere of confrontation. I'm worried about that. And Colombia, I think we are not doing it well right now, in particular with eradication and substitution. And if we don't do it, let's forget about the United States. We, have, we are in trouble within our country. So we have to work on it. I don't want and the, ¿cómo se dice? Fumigación, aspersión. Okay, I don't, I don't want that, but this requires a government that can have a real intervention in those places where we know we have to be. We knew that we had to be in there, and we haven't been in there. And I think there is a problem about the coordination and the way the national government is currently working, because everyone is in its own. Everyone goes from one side, but we don't get together in order to have the interventions. And in order to do this, you have to put together a group of people from the government ministries, agencies, that have to work with a leadership, a clear leadership, in order to get to the places. And we are not doing it in Colombia. And I claim it's associated with clientelism, because this politician is the owner of this ministry. The other politician is the owner of this agency. And you have plenty of owners, political owners, that don't work together. And if we don't work together, we are not going to get this done. And the other guys, they do know how to work together. I think it's a problem. Let me have one final question, if I could, and then uh, we'll open it up. Uh, you, you talked about how Colombia doesn't have a norte uh, direction today. And uh, as Lewis Carroll said, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Uh, but I'd like to get your just looking beyond Colombia and looking in, in the past in Colombia, just getting some context and perspective. I mean, where do you see um, in the world, in the region, uh, there being really a, a society, a country where there is a, a, a clear direction that you, or even in Colombia in the past? I mean, is this something that Colombia had at one point that lost or is? 
something that's been struggling to get. I mean, that kind of very clear direction, purpose, um, did you, was that there in Colombia and now it's disappeared or that's been something that's been a problem for a long time? National Front, because that closed all possible ideas. They negated any possible difference because this, the country was divided with the liberales y los conservadores each term, they will alternate terms. All the administrative position was, they were evenly split. And I, I was growing up seeing that, and that was not the place for someone who wanted to be part of a society. But the conditions that we have had, when I said the main characters that we have had, the guerrillas, narco traffickers, paramilitary, illegal, corrupt, have taken a lot of energy from us in Colombia. Actually, Colombia is remarkable. It's my country that I love, and, and I'm being critical in the sense that that's what we are seeing now. But if you look around and say, well, Colombia has gone through all these things, and that's why I'm disappointed, or not disappointed by sad, let's say sad, when we have this quite, quite decent opportunity to have this agreement, and we are not moving anywhere. We are completely divided as society after having achieved the agreement with FARC. But we have spent all of our, our energies associated with this sort of conflicts that we have had. So I claim that this is quite a chance that we have in Colombia. And if we give ourselves that chance, we will be bright in many senses. Let me give you an example. And maybe the Colombians here, you look very young, all of you. Uh, do you remember La Misión de Sabios? Anyone remembers the, what about you? <laughs> La Misión de Sabios, what used, I mean, it, the, it, the wise men mission created by Cesar Gaviria. And the, he asked the brightest people in Colombia, including, of course, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, to write a work that will tell Colombia how to follow science and education as the leading path that we will follow in Colombia. We have, that, was hap that happened in 1994. So then we said 1% of the internal gross product, uh, in Producto Interno Bruto should be dedicated to science and technology. And after 23 years, we still have not advanced. We still talk about 0.5%. 3% dedicated to science, technology, information. Now entrepreneurship comes in there. We haven't bet on what we have in an incredible amount of resources, which is our creativity and our intelligence and the richness of nature in Colombia. But we haven't had a chance to bet on that. And that's what I say when I, when I said this, is because we have done it, because I think it's the path that we have to go. And that's what Colombian people we need in our lives. That's why we have to change the narrative, and we can do it. But what is happening now is not working in that direction, and we hopefully we will, we will change direction. But I didn't I didn't finish showing you how difficult it's going to be for the next president. I just talk about the justice reform that we need, and the the clouds that are on facing it. But we have the pension reform the health reform. We haven't talked about the peace agreement. I mean, those are reforms that we have in there. And we are only going to have four years because President Santos, and this is an example that upsets me, and I'll, I'll say it. Then he decided that they, there was going to be no re-election, but after he was re-elected. That's a matter of coherence. If you are against re-election, which I, I perfectly understand, don't reelect yourself, or not. I may, or I, I wasted my time in Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin learning mathematical logic. Uh, Let's open it up. Uh, please tell us who you are and be brief. Why don't we start with uh, Uber here? I'm gonna go over there. Please just here. You have a microphone. Schultz, uh, I represent uh, an education company, so I was very pleased to. See what you talked about education. 
Uh, and thank you for the uh, <coughs> mathematical clarity and simplicity of your talk. Maybe it's your daughter's fault. But at any rate, can you help me understand what's the difference between Colombian uh, corruption and what's going on all over the world? Or were you actually describing the US? Because talk about campaign financing, lobbying, uh, Congress uh, corruption, and so forth. You describe the US uh, to the dot. <laughs> well, I'm going to answer very politely. It may be all over the world, but that doesn't solve our problem. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back there, and then we'll go here. Thank you. Uh, Joaquin Vazejo from the Pan American Development Foundation, or CUPAD, as it's known in Colombia. My question is regarding the raising concerns about the delays in the implementation of the peace process, from the demobilization of the combatants to the destruction of the weapons to the turning in of the child soldiers, etc. Some people are worried that FARC is doing this because they're afraid that the state is not going to keep their end of the deal. And if they go too fast, quote unquote, they might lose negotiating power. And that's reasonable considering that they might have a sense that the incoming government, if someone from the far right is elected, might undo part or all of the peace accord. So, do you share that assessment, or do you think uh, the agreement is at risk by the upcoming elections? Let's say, to begin with, I hope not. Now, facing what we are facing right now, I said before, there was no uh, uh, pedagogy about what this means for Colombia. And that was a missed opportunity. We should have won this election overwhelming. It should have been 80% yes, 20% no, and we lost. And that's a message, the things that were not doing well, and, and we are paying the cost for it, but the problem is that we are not fixing things that should be fixed. If I were president of Colombia today, right now, in all these places, all these guys would be, at this time, all of them would be studying they would have some productive projects, and there would be a people coming to these places to see how this can be done. In principle, numerically, that shouldn't be difficult. 8,000 people in a country that has 50 million people. They are dispersed in 26 sites. So if you put 100 educators in this sense for site, that's 2,600 people. In Colombia, we have these people. We have the international cooperation helping on these things. We knew where the, they were going to be located. It wasn't decided the day before. And they said, but that, that's too far. It was too far when they chose the places. So many things could be done so people in Colombia would understand. So that you would limit, for example, silly questions, but people take them seriously. Would you accept living in your building with a former guerrilla member? And people said, no way. The probability that you have a guerrilla member living in your same building is zero. <laughs> but you have to explain these things. There are 8,000, 50 million people. They are throughout the, co the countryside. And then you talk about these questions, because there is no explaining. So now. What happened last week was the Constitutional Court changed the way we understood the agreement. So they changed the way the treatment that is going to be given or it was supposed to be given in Congress. For example, uh, uh, Odebrecht is a German word? There is, it must be. So we in Colombia, we all know one German word. And we knew two English words, fast track. <laughs> that, that's, everyone talks about the fast track. That was the name that was given to this procedure. Now, nobody translates that into Spanish. Fast track. Everyone in Colombia knows two English words, fast track. Now, we don't know what is going to happen. With the ruling by the Constitutional Court, we don't know what is going to happen. So plenty of uncertainty. It's not clear what is going to occur. So 
we can see the FARC people reacting, saying, come on, guys, this is changing. We don't know what is happening. The president has said a, hasn't said a word. Nobody has explained what happened. And so this, there is uncertainty. And that's not good for anyone in any aspect of life. For example, we were going to create, we, we have a civic movement that we began 18 years ago. We want to come convert our civic movement into a political movement with some rights that the Constitution would give us. In the negotiation, the FARC was given, I mean, the opportunity to have their own party. They are going to have uh, some positions in Congress for two consecutive terms guaranteed. And in addition to that, they are going to have public financing for their political activities. I think that's correct. This is a negotiation. We want them to get into politics. If they need to get into politics, and start doing it. So we, and, but at the same time, they said, but we are going to open it up the possibility so that, so that other groups in Colombia could become parties. So we were going to become a party and said, well, we have been 18 years in politics. We have won the mayorship in Medellin twice. I have been governor and so on. So we are going to formalize our movement. And the government, first, they submitted, they presented a, a law project where the conditions that they were going to put on us were impossible, like having 100, I mean, 525,000 militants with the carnet, with the affiliation card. And we claim, may, not even in Cuba, in the Communist Party, they have did many people with the identification card belonging to the party. We managed to change that, discuss with the government, and they came up with something reasonable. But that was up until last Wednesday. Today, we don't know if we can, the movement that we have, we can make sure that we formalize it into a political movement. There is uncertainty. So it's not that the FARC, it's my intuition, I have never talked to them. And uh, it's not that the FARC, they don't want to do this, but there is plenty of uncertainty all over, and nobody knows how to answer. So in a week, they should be finishing, handing out their guns. But they had trouble getting in there, getting the people who would be in there, and now there is this condition. They don't know what is going to happen. So now they are talking about renegotiating the this, this, uh, disarmament. But all of that, at the same time, makes the atmosphere worse, because then, you don't know what is happening. It's, I don't like what is happening. I, I think it's, it's fragile. And that's what it, how it's working. We hope it, it gets strengthened. But it's, it's difficult, and we have to be very careful. Yes, please. Buenas tardes. Um, my name is Blanca Betancourt, and I'm a teacher also. I would like to ask you something that maybe is not going to be too elevated. But we have seen the process with the paramilitary people. So after the paramilitary um, process, they, uh, it came up um, some back cream. So there is now paramilitary groups now are back cream now. And then uh, when Pablo Escobar and the Cali cartel were dismantled, there are, um, at this point there is the double of hectares of cultivation in Colombia. So my question is, how are we, uh, and, and a simple example if is in Bogota, in some corners, I've been teacher in Bogota for 15 years. In some corners we can see groups of 10 children seven, 10 years old, and one 13 year old more or less, teaching them how to sell and how to consume drugs and sell them in the schools. So what is going, what, what, how can we rescue these children? Now we are talking about the peace process. How are, you go, are we going to rescue our children from the, soup, the, the new guerrilla groups, because it's like if the founder of McDonald's pass away, but there are McDonald's everywhere. So my question is that, how, what is the strategy, because you are a teacher and I know you understand that, what is the strategy to rescue our children in the neighborhoods from those 
dangers. The paramilitary, the back room, the drugs, and now the guerrilla, the mini guerrilla groups. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I mentioned, citizen security, which is associated with that phenomenon. I talk about micro-traffic. What you are describing is <laughs> how micro-traffic works. And, and that has to be a real concern for us in Colombia. And that's why not, we cannot just say it, it doesn't matter if they grow more drugs, uh, cocaine in Colombia, as long as it's going to go in somewhere else. But it's within Colombia, we have a problem that we have to deal with. Unfortunately, we have had quite a school of gang formation. Because with all these cartels, with the criminality associated with those cartels, the high levels that they have moved up in the criminal world worldwide, then we have, qu we have had quite a school. So many people who have been there are having their own spaces, and this is multiplying. We have to be very careful with that. We have to pay attention to that uh, so that we are not going to have a new round of violence with different groups. And it has to do with, for ex I'll, I'll explain to you with one example. Seven, eight years old, well, it may happen. But roughly speaking, if you look at some places in Colombia, you look at high school, the last two years in El Bachillerato, then those two last years, for example, if you go to Tumaco, those of you who have heard of Tumaco is the most difficult town that we have in Colombia today. It's in the south, close to Ecuador, by the Pacific. And the FARC moved from there, and there has been chaos in that place. Many groups coming into there. Some people who were from the FARC uh, didn't follow the orders. And it's quite a terrible place. And if you go there, you find, roughly speaking, out of 100 kids that should be in school, in high school at the moment, age around 17 years old, out of 100, you have 80 who are not in there. And if you have 80 kids, 70 years old, sitting in the corners of Tumaco or anywhere in the world, after a few days, then you have plenty of problems. One of the main things that we have to do, I would do, and I have an experience because when I was the mayor of Medellin, when we were elected, the national government, in that case led by President Uribe, negotiated with the auto defenses, with the paramilitary at the mobilization. And then in Medellin, before we got into power, before I got into office, we were already had close to a thousand former paramilitary who have negotiated will waiting for us to reintegrate them into society. When you are going to reintegrate people into society, you have to make sure that the ones who are coming out don't come back. There is a margin. Some people, we know that in a process like that, some people would return to their criminal activities. But we have to minimize that percentage. And you have to come up with a special programs with these people who were in there. And those are very carefully designed programs. For example, in Medellin, when this happened, at the end, we ended up having like 4,500 people reintegrated into Medellin. That's when I say 8,000 people in Colombia, with the size that we have in Colombia, that could be done. We had them in Medellin. You have to make sure that they come out. But there are some who are waiting right in there to get to replace them. And you have to move with the ones who you move out, but with the ones that are about to come to enter to be replacement of these people. And that's a very different program. And the main thing that you have to do, the first thing to, you have to do is how you have them in school. The first thing is they should be in school at that age. And then from the school, you can start working on many things associated with how, what happens with their families, what's the relationship in the communities, and so on. And of course, what you have to do is when these guys move out, you have to go directly with the state, police, the justice system, and opportunities into those places where they were being located. That's what you have to do. The best place to take these kids is in, into a school. 
And if you are into school, you can design many policies because in school they have to go daily and they can observe and then the teachers know these guys are in trouble. These are the ones who are moving in this direction. These guys not coming to school. And then you have a way of acting. Of course, then you have to come up with teams of people who can deal with kids in that way. But that is, that is a political decision. You have to work on this and to make sure that you have implemented. And I, my, I'm convinced, and I have seen it, it works. But well, you have to put it to work, which is not that difficult. That's my claim. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Max Lowenthal. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins uh, SICE, and I worked at the Marine North Foundation in Medellin teaching English for a little while. Um, and I I'm curious to see or to ask how clearly there's a lot of, of problems to be solved within the federal government. But given your experience at the more local level, how are you seeing local governance, whether at the municipality level um, and or even the provincial level, how are you seeing the kinds of strategies that were uh, undertaken in Medellin, how are they dispersing throughout the country and are they dispersing? And how is leadership improving at the local level? I think we have improved in Colombia. My claim, and that's why I'm here, is but we have to have quite a change in politics, the way politics are done. Politicians are the ones who make the most important decisions in our society, regardless of the fact that we may not like them. They will do it. And it has to do with politics, and that's why I'm here, because I, I shouldn't be here. I, I, I could be in Washington talking about model theory of stochastic processes, the, book, the other book that I wrote, <laughs> Not From Fear to Hope, <laughs> which I co-wrote with my, my advisor at the University of Wisconsin. His name is Jerry Kisler, an outstanding man that I admire and love him so much. But I could be here talking about that. Now, it's politics, and it has to do with politics and what we do in politics. And I think we have been improving. But what happened in Colombia? You may say, well, in other countries, you haven't, had, you haven't had that violence. And then uh, they also have these huge levels of corruption. For example, Mexico, a country that I love, Mexico. But I think what happened in Colombia is that we concentrated our energies in these aspects. And this was growing in a way that is at the level that where we are right now and it has to be in politics it has to be through power getting access to power to change society we have been improving <laughs> but it's still a long way to do to go it's not going to be easy it's quite a I have said this sentence I'm going to say it here corruption la corrupción is it's a criminal enterprise more difficult to fight than guerrillas and narcotraffic that's what I believe and I'm talking about the experience that I had. I have a, here a Carlos Molina, my friend, who went to the university with me. He came to live here, and I, I, became, I became a politician. But <laughs> anyway. John. John Maestro, the microphone. John Maestro, a former US diplomat in the area. I was in Colombia last week. I was at Uniandes and I was at the Universidad Nacional and I wanted to ask you a question about the university and university students in the peace process because you've described a peace process that legally exists but is not quite being carried out. Is there a role for Colombian universities and university students in the peace process? And the thing is that the peace process now is five years old. And the problem is that we were, we, I mean, most people in Colombia were engaged since early on. So, for example, when the agreement was about to be signed, 
with one month left, people, the government came and said, well, you can load down the agreements, 300 pages, read them so that we can have discussions. There was no pedagogy. So people were not really involved with this. Because if you were in Bogota before the signing of the agreement, nobody was worried about violence in Bogota. People would be walking the streets, and it wasn't that we were fearful that people were really worried about the FARC. So this needed an explanation to a generation of people. 60% of Colombian people are under 40. For them, the Soviet Union is something diffuse. The Cuban Revolution, who would, I, I always give this example, and I'm going to have the artist right here in front. Who would think that in a peace agreement with FARC in Havana, there would be an American sitting there throughout the conversations? And the Secretary of State would go there and would shake hands with the guerrillas. That's an unimaginable. Nobody would have ever thought that this could have happened. And it happened. So the, mo the world is very different. And we didn't take the time, I say we, the ones who were would yes, to take the time to explain to people that it was something very deep. For, and I think it's very deep for Colombia. So right now, students at the university level, they may sympathize. Some, but the confusion is such that people are not actively saying we, we, are, we belong to the peace process, something extraordinary is happening. Actually, something remarkable in, in a negative sense, there has been this demobilization and most Colombians haven't paid attention to it. So there is no, at this time, there is not a reaction positive reaction in the sense, because Humberto de la Calle, for example, has given, he is associated with the peace process. I like him very much, and I have plenty of respect and admiration for him. But he has been talking about this is in danger. We have to uh, protect it. But no people, people don't react. You don't see people going to the streets to take care of, I mean, express support for the peace process. The president is not very active within Colombian politics these days. So that's the situation that I see. So the answer is no. No, not at this time. So final question from Francesco, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, hello, Sergio. We met before. I, I know your son, Alejandro, at HKS. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you here in the dialogue. Uh, I'm from Venezuela. I'm from a foundation called Visión Democrática. And I'm sure you're used to being asked about Venezuela, but I'd really like to hear your opinion uh, specifically on the recent events in Venezuela uh, and on the Maduro's proposal for a national constitutional assembly uh, and hear your thoughts on, on that specifically and what Colombia can do to, to further help uh, democracy in Venezuela. Well, I think there are no words to express the dismay, the outrage, you put the words that you may want to, to think about Maduro and what he has been doing. I mean, nonsense to the outside world. They know what they are doing or some of the things that they have been doing it. Uh, I, re I read a column by Moises Naim this, this last Sunday was saying the Cubans, the ones that support what is happening in there, and the Cubans know how to deal with these things and so on. It's terrible, let's put it that way. Now, Colombia. The first, very simple thing. The first thing that we have to do is to avoid to become the issue for Venezuela. And that means the obvious thing, so that be careful and don't accept any provocation in order to have a conflict between Colombia and Venezuela. In Venezuela, as you know, Colombia has always been used in a political way to deal with internal affairs. And we, ha we cannot do that. Now, in Colombia, so for example, in Arauca, there was a military group that moved into Colombian territory. It was perfectly clear that they were in Colombian territory. Now, there are some guys in Colombia that said, you should go and fight them 
and show that we are strong and so on. And I, I think that would be the worst mistake that Colombia could make to, make, to provoke or accept that confrontation. That would be a terrible mistake. I think Colombia has handled out that well. Now, secondly, something that is that we have to say too. Some people have been saying, how come now we are going to have Venezuelans coming into Colombia and they are going to take our jobs and so on? And I always said, Colombia has to be a decent country in the sense that how many people from Colombia went to Venezuela for years and made their livings in there? Or how many Colombians are throughout the world? We have been relegated at a very low level, being Colombia in the world at the beginning, it's not quite a, a nice presentation, but most Colombians work hard, and they are very well respected because the quality of Colombian workers, when they go outside, they do it, and they, they have struggled, but Colombia should recognize that and don't, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very shameful when I hear people saying we should then let Venezuelans come into Colombia. We have to have solidarity, in Colombia, a country that has been discriminated so much, where we have people throughout the world, we should be careful in the way we receive them. And it's difficult, of course. It's very easy to say that this person is going to take my job, but that's not the problem. And we have to deal with that. And the third thing is Colombia has to be part of this international pressure. I don't think Colombia has to be the one that leads that confrontation. I think Almagro has been doing it well in the Organization of the American States. He has been consistent. He has been saying it. Colombia should support those efforts and try to be part of that. But it's not that Colombia has to take the leadership role in that, because that will be easy provocation. Now, it's very different to have the Peruvian government moving their ambassador to Venezuela that Colombia moving, removing the ambassador in Venezuela. So I think those are very basic things. I myself personally, I feel that is una calamidad what is happening there. I have, I'm a personal friend of Leopoldo, which I like him very much, and I, and I have no words to express my regret and opposition to what is happening in there. Now in Colombia, in Colombia today, with this confrontation, part of the confrontation is being saying, look, that's where we are going to be. If these guys, who are they? We don't know. Is these guys coming to power? Castro Chavismo. So at the same time, within our country, it's becoming a very, very touchy issue because the ones who are, don't share a particular view of society they are called Castro Chavistas. I haven't, still, I haven't been called Castro Chavistas yet, but I suspect that very soon they are going to tell me Castro Chavista, and I'm not ni Castrista, ni Chavista, ni Madurista. Anyway. You're a dialoguero. That's better. I am an oh, independent, independent movement for right. compromiso. Ciudadano. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, this has been a terrific session. I want to thank Sergio for coming by and sharing his thoughts, uh, which are always thought-provoking and very lucid, and the uh, situation is complicated, uh, but we certainly hope for the best, and hopefully this is a, a moment uh, of real significant opportunity and change um, in Colombia, and uh, I know your role, whatever happens, your role is going to be fundamental to making that happen. So, Stay tuned. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah.